of course, continue. I'd like uh, to thank uh, the Forum for gathering these voices to debate about the region and about it con our continent. Uh, a very quick uh, introduction. They don't need much introduction. Uh, president uh, of the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development and former president uh, of the Dominican Republic, Dr. Fernandez, thank you for joining us. Ernesto Samper, Secretary General of the Union of South American Nations and former president of Colombia, thank you for joining us. Ricardo Villela, Executive Vice President of Itaú Unibanco, thank you for joining us. And President Gonzalez will be joining us soon. So in any case, gentlemen, I would like to start by talking about the region and about the economy. Nothing better than a forum like this one. We have heard in the past few months and repeatedly that the golden age is over. If uh, we paraphrase what a financial report was saying, the party is over. I mean, we are in the after party, an after party that is not uh, easy for many sectors, in particular for the most uh, vulnerable. Uh, foreign investment is dropping in the continent. Uh, the oil prices are dropping. Uh, the dollar is uh, rising in its price, and growth is flat. Uh, the economist uh, uh, say, all of them, that when there is a crisis, there is an opportunity. So let me start by asking. Asking, what is the opportunity that you see today for this uh, continent? Mr. Fernandez, uh, yes, thank you very much for this kind invitation to participate uh, together with distinguished colleagues and friends in this panel. Of course, uh, the uh, financial boom, the economic boom, the golden era in the region is definitely over. And this is due to a series of internal and external factors, indeed, in um, in terms of growth, uh, if we were growing 4 to 5 percent previously, today the forecasts are that Latin America will grow at 0 0.5 percent. And basically, in South America, because we must make a distinction between Mexico, the Central, Central America, and the Caribbean, and South America, in the northern region, Mexico, Central America and the Caribbean, since they are more integrated with the American economy, that has been growing uh, through the application of new Keynesian policies. Uh, that region of the world has had greater stability and higher levels of growth. In the case of South America, more integrated uh, with the Chinese economy, uh, with uh, the commodities, uh, well, of course, uh, the impact has been greater. So you talk about opportunities that could emerge within the framework of this crisis. As well, let us look, for example, in the case uh, of China. Yes, there is a deceleration of growth uh, in China and also a transition towards uh, a model of experts on manufacturers. Many of those manufacturers that have uh, uh, to do with textiles, uh, medical devices that have to do with plastics could be coming to Latin America, creating new businesses. That is a possibility. Is China the opportunity for Latin America today? Latin America first is not uh, a very homogeneous region. It is heterogeneous. We need to understand each case and divide Latin America into clusters. Clearly, the party is over. The decade of prosperity is over. And now we are in the decade of uh, austerity. We need to make adjustments in Latin America. And undoubtedly, China is a strong force that has a demand of products coming from Latin America. Uh, President, please be welcome. The winds are not very favorable. Um, they are against Latin America. The super cycle of commodities has come to an end. The prices of our main uh, commodities uh, dropped by more than 50 percent. Copper, oil, soybeans, uh, all the... Um, Experts, um, all our experts, and that is why the this uh, the fiscal accounts have dropped. Latin America and uh, its macroeconomic economic foundations are different in the region. For example, in my country, Argentina, Venezuela, with different degrees of vulnerability, and we have to undertake reforms and adjustments in our countries uh, to tighten our fiscal policy and also to make adjustments in our monetary policy. In contrast uh, with what is happening in uh, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Uruguay, where the downturn is less strong. So the opportunities there in Latin America is, is 
China internal opportunity. So we are asking about the challenges in this situation where the party is over in Latin America. I'd like you to be very brief and specific. Mr. Samper, what is the opportunity for the continent? Well, generally, Latin Americans, when there is a cycle change, we say, who will come in to save us? I think that the salvation of the region is within the region itself. We have a low percentage of inter-regional trade, 18% as compared to the EU, which has a 60% internal trade. We can expand intra-regional trade. Most of that intra-regional trade it consists of manufacturing, uh, manufactured products. Uh, and uh, in the region also, we must uh, re-industrialize the region. We realize that we need to diversify the productive structure and, again, go back along the path of uh, re-industrialization. Multi-Latina companies have been growing over the past 10 years. That is a new trend. And they have been growing at a rate which is uh, twofold higher than the full for an investment. Uh, for an investment. And those uh, companies that come from the region itself may be a factor. So we have a great opportunity to leave the extractive model for development that has prevailed for many years where we live off uh, of uh, the land. And now we have the possibility of adding value to what we have uh, based on a simple premise. And it is that we have a region perhaps the wealthiest in natural resources. So it means belief in who we are, belief in what we have, in our own potential. And this is what we have heard. Mr. Gonzalez, thank you very much for joining us. And I wish to apologize for this delay. Don't worry. Sometimes logistics has its glitches. So what are the opportunities that you see for the continent? I am very optimistic, optimistic with the region. I think that there are difficult situations which are very different. Uh, perhaps it is the most difficult uh, situation of all. Uh, the most difficult situation of all is that of Venezuela. But there are other situations of difficulty like those of Brazil. But I agree with what you have just said. Indeed, I believe that if there uh, were a criticism to make regarding what has, had, what has happened during the boom era is that that boom was not really taken advantage of to diversify and create a competitive economy that can insert itself within the global economy. And we need to do it now at a time which is less uh, uh, favorable and positive. But we need to do it, and we need to do it taking advantage not only of the fact that this is a very rich region with many resources, but taking advantage of the human talent, uh, the ability to imagine, to create, to innovate, uh, that lies within the people of our region. I think that that is the best and the top resource that we have. But as always, I don't think that we should go into global assessments. I think that there are many Latin Americas uh, that are bound uh, by some identity, but it is not the same. Uh, the situation uh, b between the Pacific and the Atlantic differs. Uh, the economies on the Pacific tend to be more open. Those on the Atlantic tend to be more interventional and not all countries have suffered because of the fall of the oil prices, uh, or uh, Leonel Fernandez can tell us about that. Uh, yes, I was bringing an important point to the table. You mentioned Venezuela. I wouldn't like to go directly into that uh, uh, hot potato, we can call it that way. We've spoken about the economy now. From the political standpoint, over the past uh, decade, uh, Latin America um, saw the um, model of the socialism of the 21st century a model that today, at least for the those who are advocates of the model, uh, are, is uh, posing some question marks about viability, about the defense of uh, democratic principles. That allow me to remind you that uh, alternancies are being challenged. Uh, see what has happened in Argentina for so long. To with, oh, today, they have Macri in Venezuela, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Brazil. We have a president uh, that uh, is now uh, um, uh, uh, under the the slight of corruption at the channel where I work uh, uh, two days ago was showing images that, if you'll allow me, were really um, 
uh, appalling. In Venezuela, people want to buy basic commodities. They have no opportunities. They go out to protest, and they find that the Bolivariana police uh, is exercising repression in a brutal fashion, if you'll allow me. So it is the end of a cycle. Is it the end of a cycle, Mr. Fernandez? Well, let us first understand conceptually what uh, socialism in the 21st century is about, because it has been uh, construed in different ways. I think that at the bottom, we have the relationship between the state, the market, and society. There has been a conception of economic policy in the sense that if the state plays the fundamental role in promoting developmental policies, and we're talking about populism or about neo-populism, if we depart from the premise that it is the market, the, that the market is the only engine, then we fall in the extreme of neoliberalism. I think that uh, what has missed is a combination between the state and the market uh, uh, going beyond uh, neo-populism and neoliberalism. In Latin America, what we've seen probably is a predominance of a type of development model uh, supported either on the state or on the market. Now, in terms of what is uh, socialism in the 21st century means, some people were talking about social democracy. Others were saying that it could be a new populist model. And there were people who would demonize and say that the left was carnivorous and the, la and the right was a vegetarian. Uh, so in ideological terms, we don't know what we're talking about. And if you'll allow me to conclude this part, what I feel it is not only Latin America, but the rest of the world. I think that as of the impact of the global financial crisis, there has been a structural change, radical change, not only in Latin America, but everywhere. There have been two trends, a trend that tries to emerge from the crisis using uh, policies for development, uh, that is the, state, the style of Obama, and the other is to apply policy of austerity in the frame of recession, creating uh, unrest, political unrest and uh, dissatisfaction of the people. So we see a late effect of the global financial crisis in Latin America. And we see today that unrest and that uh, uh, dissatisfaction. But we cannot fall into false dilemmas. Uh, we shouldn't uh, fall into saying that this is a fight between neoliberals and populists. I don't think that there is a war of models here. If, if what you call the first decade, uh, which was a long decade because it was 12 years up until 2014, what it demonstrated is that all the countries in the region, no exception made and without considering whether they were left or right, realized that after the social adjustment of the 1990s and with the social price paid by the region from the application of market measures, not to call it neoliberal because that entails a stigma, the region had lost legitimacy. And all the countries, with no exception, made social investment. And uh, the big uh, achievement of the region between 2012 and 2014 was that they came up with 180 million people that came out of poverty. And the big challenge in the region, Felipe, at this point in time, is to see how these people will not go fall back into poverty. The figures tell us that there are between 8 and 10 million people who, because of the economic crisis, have gone back to the condition of poverty in which they were before. It would be disastrous for the region if the price of this crisis ends up being that the achievements of all the governments, not only the socialists, but all of them, understanding that they had to invest in the social realm, should go back, should take a step back. But in that dichotomy that you're talking about, would you agree with me that in that model of socialism of the 21st century, leftist models, if you wish to call them populist models, as Mr. Gonzalez called, uh, Mr. Fernandez called them, now there is a failure in the defense of the minimum democratic tenets. We talk about alternance, uh, repression, uh, and that is concentrated in those governments uh, of that side of the of the scale. Yes, but you need to consider other factors. And let me give you the case of my country in order not to uh, go into a, another's uh, land. The re-election without a checks and balances in all countries of the region not only socialist countries, has given rise to a concentration of power. So Colombia, the case of Colombia, the president may appoint every four years 
presidents may appoint two people for the central bank, send three names to the constitutional court, send two or three names to the Supreme Court. What happens with the re-elections since there was not a rebalancing of power? Then the organs of power ended up having the control of the executive, and the same thing happened in other countries. So I think that that is a challenge that we still need to solve. But since I have to vindicate my region, in the past 30 or 40 regions uh, years, um, the region has voted 117 times. There has not been one single democratic rupture. And I think that endorses this condition of the region. It is an asset in the sense that we still vote here and there is still a democracy here. It's interesting, as a Secretary General of UNESUR, it's interesting for you to confess this in a forum like this one. Mr. Gonzalez. What is the framework? We are in a crisis of governance of the representative democracy in every every place in the world. It's what has happened in the U.S., in Austria, in the latest elections in Italy. I can give you many examples. What for many years we have considered uh, as democracy being supported in around the center, that's where the majority articulates, and it is the middle classes that support and give power to democracy and strength to democracy. That is in crisis right now, among other things, because the model of global economy is a model that is giving rise to inequality. In the World Economic Forum, it was said in February already, an inequality that uh, creates problems of sustainability. And I'm not talking about ideology, so uh, socialism of the 21st century, which is sometimes de uh, depicted as a 19th century socialism, as a regressive utopia, as Cardoso would say. But I'm not talking about the ideology. In, in that, I tend to agree with what Evo Morales said some while ago. He said the ideology is all right, but if we, it doesn't and feed the people it doesn't seem to be as good. So it is a good approach to say, hey, don't you see ideology as a straitjacket to uh, blame others uh, for uh, uh, others for your failures as a ruler? So it's not so much that there is a cycle that is changing. I would like to know how many companies. Uh, have been uh, have been uh, uh, statetized by Lula during his time in power. None, and people tend to say, "Oh, Brazil, Argentina, the the model." Uh, the Venezuelan model, the socialism of the 21st first, first century, it's not. And what will happen with the governments, uh, the governments that were in uh, power during the implosion of Lehman Brothers uh, paid for something that was not their responsibility, they paid for it. And the governments that have been in power during the crisis of raw materials uh, will pay a price, also will pay for that. Uh, many of them have their own ideology, uh, which tends towards the left. Uh, but are they paying a higher price? price, those that were aligned to the model of the 21st century modern socialism than those who didn't, they did not align. Okay, let's see. With all due respect for Venezuela, it, it's difficult because it seems that it lost credibility, but what has happened in Venezuela has not happened in any other country of the region. And that is why the situation of Venezuela is a, um, it's an extreme situation. But every time Venezuela is compared with Argentina or even with Ecuador or with Bolivia, I say, no, what has happened in Venezuela has not happened in any other place. What is happening in Venezuela? Yes, what has happened? And as a model, as a model accelerated by the problem of the fall in the oil prices, etc. There is a common factor in Venezuela. They came out of extreme poverty. Many people came out of extreme poverty. Yes, of course, the government that pulls them out at a given period of time takes those takes the score. But Santos could also have done it in Colombia because many people also came out of poverty. It was the same model. It doesn't seem to be the same model. Now things are more difficult. And... Uh, 
Yes, I, I see some laughs there because there are people that say, yes, A, Santos is, is being contaminated. and and But since uh, the policy is multifaceted, everything can be done. Uh, people can say all kinds of things like I'm doing right now. But, uh, of course, I want to close around. Um, and I would like to go back to the essence of your initial question. At the If we are at the end of a cycle, and I would say, in relation to that question that, yes, we are at the end of a cycle, at the beginning of a new one, and uh, it is a new normal. It is a new normal of less growth for Latin America as a whole, as long as we don't change uh, the business model and the platform of diversification of our economy, and the dividends of the reforms of the 1990s have come to an end. The Latin American region basically needs uh, to go a step further. And how? Do, and as we see in uh, Chile, I visit Chile every fortnight. It is very difficult to find uh, or solve the social demands in a country, in a country that is growing at a slower pace. Uh, in the previous cycle of commodities, we had an accelerated growth, and uh, but we. Now there are less fiscal, there's less fiscal revenue. So in order to create an e easier way out, the governments need to test necessary reforms that are needed to improve productivity, as Felipe Gonzalez was saying, bring investment to the countries and create economic growth and well-being for the population in order to solve the protests that we've seen with different degrees of violence, people asking for better quality public services. So there is an opportunity to improve a lot in Latin America. And um, we find uh, that uh, global competitiveness uh, rankings uh, show that we have underperformed, unfortunately. When we take the, ca the case of Brazil, number 75, Argentina 76, Chile is the best in our region in uh, the ranking of the 35. And we and we need to work to improve the conditions of our country. So I say that these crises, and that goes back to your question, did create an opportunity, an opportunity for change, mainly political change, which I know we will be discussing, for example, what happened in Argentina, a more market-friendly, or what happened in Brazil with the constitutional impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, and what is happening in the Venezuelan Assembly, the Parliament. And I think that it is a change for the better, and not only Venezuela, but now that you mentioned Brazil, give me a second. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, the impeachment to Dilma Rousseff. Uh, is that all what is happening in Brazil? A fight inside the party, or will it be an opportunity for things to change in Brazil? I see this crisis as an opportunity. Um, the, the, the symbol in the Chinese proverb, uh, China, uh, crisis and opportunity, I think applies here. I think that the model of the socialism of the 21st century and populism that sold one thing to the population and delivered something that was completely different was eventually unsuccessful. So all of the reforms in the fiscal balance, uh, the inflation, the pillars that Enrique Cardoso left um, went by the wayside. Uh, during a favorable economic cycle, when this changed, we saw a reduction of 75 percent in this government. So there was a constitutional reform. Um, the uh, impeachment process uh, happened, and it shows the strength of our institutions and the maturity of Brazilian democracy. Uh, this impeachment will become official in August. We will have a transitional government to make the necessary reforms in order to leave a legacy so that Brazil can once again have sustainable growth within its democratic platform. And if I may add that given the level of corruption or the number of cases that are pending on members of Congress, it would appear that it will be a very complicated process. Um, Mr. Fernandez, yes, I just wanted to clarify the following, whether in Latin America we are witnessing the end of a cycle or not. I share Felipe's idea that we are witnessing a world scale, a global scale end of a cycle. Uh, let's look at Europe. After the financial crisis, after Lehman Brothers in 2008, up to 2015, 23 elections were held in Europe. Out of those 23, 21 incumbents lost. 
So if it was a government from the right, the left would win. If it was the left, the right would win. Sarkozy lost in France, and the Socialist Party uh, arrived with Francois Hollande. But today, you can notice how the far right, the extreme right, the, the National Front, the Le Pen family is threatening even victory in the next elections. Look at Spain. The the, the Socialist Party in Spain was in power when the crisis arrived, and the crisis ar brings PP into power. But this crisis, in turn, has, 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 has created new political actors. The social protest, the indignados movement, if you remember, in Europe and especially in Spain. You, so you're talking about the credibility of those who govern. But due to the crisis, without the crisis, this phenomenon would not have happened. In the U.S., we go from one extreme to the other, from the Occupy Wall Street movement to Donald Trump. And we are going to mention this in the end of the debate. So you need to connect politics and economics. Bad economic times always bring bad political times. Wouldn't it be that bad policy leads to bad economic times? Both. But right now, it is the economic crisis that... Um, that blew the cover on a number of political and governance problems. And I want to bring you back to politics, but I want to go back to what Felipe said, which I found important, which is that the backdrop of what is happening politically here in the region is a crisis of the representative system. And what do I mean by this? That the parties are failing, that the presidentialist system is failing. We are one of the few regions in the world where the presidentialist system persists. And in my judgment, there are some de facto powers that are, in fact, impairing governance. These are actors who are doing policies. These are media conglomerates, economic groups, uh, even judges who are um, uh, judicializing politics and non-governmental organizations. All of these de facto powers are doing politics without political accountability and without political parties. Just like sometimes you get uh, lactose-free milk and, and, and calorie-free sugar and alcohol-free beer. Well, well, now we have politics without politicians, which is a way of, of ending politics. And sometimes where it's hard to buy anything is Venezuela. Now that you're talking about what they offer, uh, things for sale, if I may. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, you mentioned Venezuela, which is the most serious problem that the region has, politically speaking. And I don't think that anybody in this panel would disagree. There is a proposal for dialogue. There are those who say that dialogue is simply giving breathing room to a government that needs time. Are you in favor of this dialogue? Yes. And to answer to your question, my answer is a very clear and resounding yes. In fact, I'm surprised that in the end, I just want to say one thing so that it doesn't seem that I'm, uh, that I'm agreeing with this. There is nothing worse than populism from the left, except for populism from the right. So this, uh, this uh, discourse that populism belongs to the left, well, why don't you ask Donald Trump? I'm going to thank him and build him a monument because he is demonstrating to the world that there can be a xenophobic ex excluding populism that is far from being from the left. And it makes things clear. Now, I find populism repugnant from one side of the spectrum or the other. And in Venezuela, what is needed is dialogue, semicolon. An agreement, semicolon, and reconciliation, period. If it's dialogue only to gain some time, whoever wishes to gain some time, needs to understand that the only thing that Venezuela lacks is time. Time has run out. Dialogue is the best of all possible mechanisms in a society that is very polarized, very divided. The best way to agree, to make agreements about crises Crises plural, because the country is facing three crises. But there is no time left. And what should be included in this dialogue? Because it's very beautiful to talk about dialogue. Nobody's against dialogue. Yes, nobody's against dialogue. How can you be against dialogue? And they know this, so they have their roadmaps. If you ask me, Mr. the Mr. Director General of UNASUR and the um, mediators who have uh, proposed the need for dialogue, um, whatever they may say, for the first time, the Venezuelan government has accepted to sit on the table. Of course, there is a lot of polarization, so people may say, dialogue with no conditions. 
Well, to sit down and talk, you don't need any conditions, unless one of the conditions is to fulfill the Constitution. And is that being fulfilled now? No, I don't think so. I think that we can, we can, we can make progress. And uh, we haven't talked about this, so I apologize. And I, I may wait and talk about this later. Yes. But I see that there is an institutional crisis, a very serious crisis. But it is not serious only because it is affecting 30 million Venezuelans, as is the socioeconomic crisis and, and, and scarcity. But the institutional crisis affects everybody because it is instrumental. The general, the National Assembly is not working. The opposite of the star judges. The judges here, um, they crash and burn because they are, have to follow orders from the executive. They have to do what they're told. 19 laws supported by parliament that was just elected in December, 18 of which were declared unconstitutional by the judges. Maybe there's an institutional sandwich going on, and I say this uh, tongue in cheek. And we need to stop that. We need to. We need. We need. We need laws to be enforceable. Okay, let me uh, go with Fernandez first. As Felipe says, we are promoting dialogue, and the argument is this. Uh, we have a very good relationship with the opposition. We don't only talk with the government, although we do. But we also talk with the opposition, with the many multiple sectors of the opposition, which is one of the biggest problems that we have. And what I have told them is this. Look, why don't you follow the example of what happened in Colombia? It took us 50 years to realize that the, that the way out was political. Number two, when we realized that the way out was political, each party asked a concession from the other what it is that should be discussed in the negotiation table. So as a concession, give me what I'm going to discuss with you at the table. So let's agree on the agenda. So then why dialogue? And number three, the most painful thing is that we had 280,000 dead while we, that's how long it took us to do what President Santos is doing in Havana that deserves our support. Well, the same thing is happening in Venezuela. There's a lot of mistrust. We launched an electoral mission in December, and nobody believed that it was going to get anywhere. People said that there was going to be fraud, violence, people killed. What happened? Nothing. The opposition won the National Assembly. And like Felipe well said, right now what we need to do is to make them live with each other. Of course, they have grievances against each other, but air them at the negotiation table through dialogue. Let's stop this campaign that unfortunately the media is, I think, uh, throwing, uh, airing the fire. And, and this is ending uh, Venezuela. And I have to defend the media because the media looks at current events and what is happening in Venezuela is important for us all. And that is why the media is there. Um, we cannot ignore what is happening? And before handing the floor to Mr. Fernandez, are you in favor of the, uh, the, the impeachment referendum happening this year? The position of UNASUR is very clear. We agree that the, uh, that the, the destitution referendum is part of the Venezuelan um, constitution, the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, and any political sector can use it. This year, well, that is not up to us. We don't set the deadlines. People say, why don't you set a date? Well, there is a regulation. I'm not going to quote it because we will run out of time, but there is a regulation and we need to follow it. If that regulation allows it to happen this year, very well. Otherwise, it will be next year. The longer we wait, the more tension there is. Mr. Fernandez and then Mr. Gonzalez, please. Yes, on this matter. Well, what we can say as from our accumulated experience is that both the government and the opposition have expressed their willingness to move toward dialogue and an understanding that only through dialogue can there be a peaceful solution that favors the national interest of Venezuelans. The agenda that was agreed has three main uh, axes. Number one, institutional respect among uh, the public powers. That is, that the executive recognizes the National Assembly and that the TCJ, that is, the Supreme Court of Venezuela, doesn't uh, revoke all of the decisions that come out of the National Assembly simply because they don't um, satisfy the desires of the executive. We need to understand that this legal aspect really uh, masks a struggle for power, in, in fact. It, it, I, don't, I don't think it's masked. I think it's shameless. Well, what we are proposing 
in the framework of dialogue is that this power struggle occurs within the institutional framework. Number two, we're talking about a commission, a truth, justice, and reconciliation commission that would address matters related to the political prisoners. And here, of course, there are divergent opinions. The government believes that some of those who are in prison today incurred in sedition, subversion, and uh, conspired to um, to 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 uh, to replace the government unconstitutionally. Of course, the the, the commission has uh, that before it. Now, the second point is the economic and the social. This has to do with the supply of medication, the supply of food. Now, in order to address the macroeconomic stability in the short term, you need a series of measures that we have uh, expressed via UNASUR that won't completely solve the problems that are necessary. After applying the basic measures to reestablish macroeconomic stability and to reactivate growth, we must have a structural reform. Now, in order to approach the, um, the rationale, so the referendum can happen this year. Yes, of course. If the National Electoral Council were to uh, agree to the uh, deadlines established by the system, it would only take five days. In five days, they would have approved uh, the signatures. These are small details, but they have annulled 600,000 signatures, among them Capriles, as a signature who signed before TV cameras, and they believe that that signature is not valid. Um, but that's not so important. Uh, the referendum is a right of citizens. The figure was, in fact, introduced by Chavez because he understood that there were three traditional powers, executive, legislative, and judicial, and a fourth power, which was the popular power. And his interpretation of popular power is that citizens can, in fact, revoke the mandate of their representatives. So this is not a right of the representatives, but rather of those who are represented. And there is an agenda, of course. Um, what are five working days? Well, it's very clear. Five working days are five working days for any of us. However, if you're only working two days a week, five working days, it's like a month, isn't it? Well, I mean, I don't want to lose a sense of humor here. There was a proposal by the anarchists in my land that they wanted a 35-hour week and a four-hour day and a 20-minute hour, which was great. Um, well, okay, that gives you a, a different period and a different deadline. Okay, let me tell Lionel the following. Um, um, first of all, I, I, I'd love to have you here, and I want, you, I want to continue talking with you throughout the day. But one of the laws that were declared as unconstitutional, arbitrarily, I must say, by the Constitutional Court, which was appointed between December 6th and January 5th. So while they were losing the election, but the new assembly hadn't been appointed yet, is the amnesty law. So the problem with the political prisoners beyond the debate as to whether or not they are political prisoners would be addressed by the amnesty law. Now, the amnesty law, of course, was revoked. If there's a truth commission, which to me is a great idea, and you asked me about the opposition and about the government, a truth commission needs to be um, uh, equitative. It needs to have both parties. You can't have the president of the republic, even if it's in good faith, to say, okay, here's the truth commission that will be presided by such and such with 80 members, and the opposition has four members. Uh, you can take your seats any time. Well, I'm sorry, but I just want to clarify this. But the, the truth commission, it's just an important thing that I want to leave clear. The truth commission sits, as it happens later, with uh, the, uh, the, the scarcity of goods and uh, this is an anecdote that can be a good, a, good, a good argument. If the Truth Commission sits, in their first act, they can say, all those people that will be investigated in order to clarify the facts with uh, the will to re reconcile will wait out of jail, not in jail. Look, 90% of Venezuelans with UNASUR surveys want their... Uh, leaders to sit down and uh, to, to, to negotiate. Why? Because they are experiencing economic difficulties that are unmanageable. That is why the approach that we have proposed is that we must first address the backdrop. Let's start with the backdrop, which is the economy. 
and UNASUR's proposal, which was presented last week, and we worked with our economic team to do this basically states the following. We're going to start by stopping the bleeding, which is the exchange rate distortion, with a floating exchange rate in order to again see a reference price for the markets, which isn't socialist by any stretch. Number two, we're going to suture the wound, meaning let's provide subsidies not to things but to people. What is common sense is not socialist. It's common sense. A floating uh, exchange rate. Come on. Now, we're going to subsidize people, and I apologize, but it's you need to know what are the bases of our proposal. Subsidizing people. Today, things are being subsidized, and what, that is why I explained that, that Colombians cross the border to go shopping because everything is costs 10 times less. And Venezuelans come to Colombia to buy medications at whatever price they can. Okay, number three, which is very important. It is true, as is being proposed, that we need to diversify the economy. Since the days of Carlos Andres Perez, Venezuela has been trying to exit the oil-dependent model. But you are proposing dialogue. I don't think that anybody disagrees with this here. However, you will agree with me that it's very difficult to dialogue when there are leaders of the opposition who are in prison. What the international community recognizes as political prisoners, isn't it time that in order to have that dialogue, you start with releasing the political prisoners? Because you talked about the process, but basic human rights are being um, violated, be they politicians or be they uh, traitors, but they're, the due process is not being respected. We had an early exploratory meeting for dialogue with the opposition and the government. And they accepted, they both accepted the agenda. And within the agenda, political prisoners is precisely um, a matter for the Truth Commission. So it cannot be a precondition to set them free in order to sit down and dialogue. The, their release will come from the dialogue. I just have a quick comment in this regard. As a Brazilian, and I think that Brazil is an important player in the region and it can help in this direction. Number one, with free and open press in order to show to Brazilian society what is happening in Venezuela. Was it, it just isn't just an economic and political crisis, it is a humanitarian crisis. Number two, now with a new government without so much ideology in the 21st century that wants to help and uh, wants to do some serious things with the, with, the, with the foreign relations ministry, I think that Brazil can position itself and better exercise its leadership in order to to even establish dialogues to release the political prisoners, which is, I think, an absurdity. And another thing, keeping quiet, silence implies consent, and Brazil was silent with respect to the dramatic situation in Venezuela. This is no longer the case. We have written a manifesto, we've written a position, and, um, and we are offering ourselves to help in uh, addressing this, this humanitarian crisis. Let's remember that in Venezuela you talk about that, but there are there are there are uh, media outlets that are still under censorship. Not only the one where uh, that I work for, yes, and there is great pressure on the media. And you defended the need for citizens to have access, their fundamental right to have free democratic access to information, and this is not happening. Either we work on solutions, or we debate on the diagnosis. I'm not going to challenge your diagnosis because Venezuela has no time to continue with diagnosing. It is clear for me what needs to be done. We need to make both institutional powers live together. That is an important task ahead. If we want to release the political prisoners, I agree. We need to do it through the institutions, through this mechanism. We need to rebalance uh, the, the, the burdens and rebalance um, the, the powers. But the economic crisis is foremost. And I want to clarify one thing too, Mr. Virela, because Virela Marino, because the, the president has not been convicted in Brazil. Our position is that there is a trial underway, and we expect that during this stage, she will have the right to uh, defense. And I'm very concerned that some sectors already make it, uh, uh, simply assume that she will be convicted in August. She can still demonstrate her innocence, and she can be proven guilty. So independently of the outcome of the trial, our position for Brazil is that the president is today 
um, indicted and she must have the right to due process. And until she is proven guilty in trial, she is the constitutional president of Brazil. Her due process will be guaranteed. Brazil is a mature democracy. It is undergoing a crisis. It is a stress test, but her rights will be respected as the rights of her 200 employees, her aircraft, her food, her defense, her attorneys, and so on. It's all guaranteed. But of course, looking at scenarios, I would say that it's more probable, much more likely, uh, that she will be indicted. And, and her situation is increasingly complicated with the new, uh, the new, the new, the new uh, uh, evidence that is coming out, the new exhibits that are coming out. Of course, the new government is not yet official. We need to await this transitional period, which is normal, but we see the, the highest probability that the transitional government will remain until 2018 when we will have open and free elections uh, in the due democratic process. I must add one thing. We live under electoral legislations that appear to be made to make government impossible. And Brazil is, uh, is, is a case in point. You can draft an electoral law. Can you make an electoral law that makes it even more difficult to have a stable government? And we seldom think about this. Now that there is a crisis in which Dilma Rousseff is being accused, and yes, it is true that there isn't a lot of balance right now in her right to defense. Of course, she's being indicted from our, the outside. Within parliament, I've been following the debates, and I haven't seen a single argument that, um, that talks about the content of the impeachment. Everything has been said except for this. But I want to say this. Of course, we have electoral legislations that are in trouble, and this will be useful for Lionel, who has the economic package, saying that, yes, Venezuela resists uh, to recognize that it's in an emergency beyond the joke that's that if you've been government, governing since January without the authorization from the assembly under an economic emergency decree that gives you full powers that has been extended twice, adding an economic exception to the economic emergency, which is a very clear recognition that there is an economic emergency relieving this matter. And I'm an old man. Um, in fact, in, in Spain, I'm called the old social democracy. I am a, an old social democrat. That is what I am. And now it turns out that Anguita, who was a communist, um, pre-Euro communist leader, is the new social democracy. Well, when the Soviet Union fell in 1991, uh, the relationships with the Russian Federation have been difficult, have been complicated, and they still are. We still need to see the relationship with Putin. That's all we have to do. The Council of Europe, of which I was a part, decided to, to send humanitarian aid and relief to the F Russian Federation under Yeltsin after the fall of the Soviet Union, because the situation was like that of Venezuela at this time, but with cold and uh, people with cold do much worse. And uh, no, there was no show. Venezuela is, is uh, showing solidarity with other countries uh, and uh, their solidarity with other countries and it should be... Uh, and I couldn't finish this panel without uh, talking about Cuba. 50 years of non-existing relationships uh, in the continent and with the Cold War and come, came to an end with the visit of President Obama, their um, attempt at appointing ambassadors uh, and uh, a process of reconnecting. I want to hear a comment before we finish. And my question is the following, with the uh, end of the Cold War in the American continent and the end of that conflict, certain players in the region then um, have no longer a boogeyman. The United States is no longer the boogeyman again uh, that, well, uh, but before we close on Venezuela about supply, very, very quickly. Let's say Venezuela 
up until now has always met its international financial obligations and therefore it should have access to foreign financing. Now, because of the internal political conflicts, uh, the country risk has uh, uh, risen and interest rates would be unsustainable. And what we're trying to do in UNASUR, Felipe, trying to solve is to have access to uh, foreign financing, bond issues. Uh, uh, but uh, the humanitarian corridor that has been proposed hasn't been approved. It's a contradiction. Yeah, but let's see. The issue of adjectives in politics are always important, the symbolic meaning of things. UNASUR is interested in bringing back normalcy to Venezuela. This means that people must have access to goods in the supermarkets, in the stores, as should be the case. And that can only be solved if there are resources available in uh, foreign exchange to authorize exports. And UNASUR is working on this. And I think that we're getting the support and endorsement of some European countries, starting with Spain, that uh, are applying a tourniquet uh, to stop the bleeding. It's not the solution, but at least, at least it's the very beginning of putting an end to the crisis that the country is experiencing. But do you agree with that humanitarian corridor? Well, we are there to decide as UN UNASUR. But do you agree? Well, I agree that Venezuela should be able to take measures that can bring Venezuela back to normalcy. Yeah, you're not answering. Now, next week... Uh, the, a medical mission from UNASUR will be there for the, the discussion of the topic of medicines. They will assess the types of medications that are needed and the channels of supply that can be used. We are working in the, in the real world, but the question about Cuba is good. <laughs> Yes, but I insist the humanitarian corridor, is it necessary? Do you agree with it? Of course, we need to create channels of, of fast-track supply, yes. The thing is that we are, you know, discussing whether it is humanitarian or not. What we need to do is bring uh, food and medications quickly and... Uh, we are proposing a card that will benefit 3 million people that can go and collect a subsidy directly. We want that to be operational. But uh, with Felipe, we are going to devote some time to that. But Cuba, OK, Cuba. This is a honeymoon, but uh, there is no wedding yet. Uh, the marriage, the wedding will occur when the embargo is lifted, uh, and the, the trade embargo is lifted, and the, when the Guantanamo Bay uh, leaves. And uh, we hope that this uh, Trump Godzilla will not win, because that will put an end to all the progress made in the recovery of this relationship with Cuba. Uh, well, you have come up with adjectives, and I have been kind with my adjective. Uh, well, I thank you. I hope that this will not become a reason uh, for not making this panel public. Uh, to give precise names, uh, well, uh, the visit by Obama, by the Pope, uh, it is one of the very big good news for this continent. Uh, one of the big news that we haven't had in many years, and the same will be true when the peace accords are signed, and that would be another a great piece of news. It's uh, undoubtedly a great step forward. It is not reversible, and of course, there are things to be done. Well, uh, the empire uh, disappearing from the public imagery would be like the disappearance of the uh, IMF. Uh, who to blame then if there is no empire to blame? But it is the empire is a useful weapon, especially for those who say that in Cuba there was an embargo. The embargo affected 30% of the failure of the revolution that was unable to diversify the economy. Yes, maybe that was the effect of the embargo, but in Venezuela, it's the opposite. The 800,000 barrels of oil that are bringing oil in are purchased by the empire. It still continues to buy oil, so it is not as evil. So yes, we need to use the words. First, we need to be very careful with the grammar, and we need to use them in their fair terms. The empire threatening this time, well, no, it doesn't seem to be a threat. The empire is responsible for the economic crisis and the social crisis in Venezuela. Well, it appears that it is not so either. Each needs to take their own responsibilities, in particular if, uh, if there is going to be a realistic way out. And uh, 
uh, get out of the uh, 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 and be pragmatic in the situation. He, pragmatic reengineering? No, no, no. I don't like that. Uh, I also hate uh, technocratic arrogance. Okay, let us uh, let us forget the semantics. Uh, about Cuba, there is an aspect that I'd like to hear your comments about. Uh, the aperture increases, but also uh, repression increases. How do you read these? Well, the symbolic value of renewing the diplomatic relationships between Cuba and the U.S. Uh, puts an end to the Cold War in the Caribbean and Latin America. Uh, Uh, 50 years later. And uh, second, I think it's a good gesture towards the rest of the region that uh, is glad to see that indeed these diplomatic relationships can be uh, reestablished. And it is also part of the agenda of President Obama, who is uh, just uh, uh, closing wounds everywhere. His presence in Hiroshima uh, uh, and his visit to Vietnam and Cuba. All this is to uh, um, close wounds. Uh, it's an agenda of peace and reconciliation. Well, and that is the value that it has. The Vietnam has a greater meaning? Yes, of course, yes. Uh, but uh, let me say, Felipe, the United States, uh, well, the first war that the United States lost was the Vietnam War. There are still many wounds in that country, people who died, the victims, and the Hiroshima and Cuba case closed that chapter of symbols uh, presented by the U.S. that wants to reconcile with the world. We're about to finish. Any more comments? Well, we are talking about uh, the Brazilian island where we, we are the only ones that uh, uh, speak Portuguese. But yeah, I was asking about the increase of repression. Well, it is not true. In uh, recent weeks, uh, more people have been detained. But what has increased, uh, and this is something that we will experience for a while, is uh, the ability to communicate what is happening. So uh, yeah, more, there is more freedom, space for freedom. There, Yes, there are responses uh, of more detained. But the adaptation will be difficult. The ideal model, in my opinion, for Raul Castro, and I am talking talking about Raul and not Fidel, is the Vietnam model. Vietnam is full of Vietnamites, and Cuba is filled with Cubans. So applying the same model with different uh, waste movement is more difficult. The Caribbean rhythm is not the Vietnam rhythm. So in Cuba, Uh, well, there are contradictions. Of course, there will be contradictions, and there will be serious contradictions. But uh, please, um, the issue of Cuba offers hope. We know more of what is happening, whether the, peop the authorities like it or not in Cuba. We're still knowing what is happening, and we are knowing it every day, thanks to the uh, work of many people, Twitter people on Twitter, people on the social media. It's not that uh, we're, we're We're getting to know what is happening. Yes, uh, Mr. Samper. What would you rather have, uh, the China model or the Soviet model of transition? And how about you? Well, I like the Chinese model because it was a model where maintaining political control, they were able to achieve economic and social aperture. Today, they have partners everywhere in the world vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Soviet model that uh, transitioned in chaos towards a democracy which is unclear. Well, I like democracy. Yes, you like democracy, but then let's come to an agreement uh, about uh, democracy what it means to you and it with what it means to me. I think these are different perceptions. So we cannot uh, establish paradigms, um, dogmatic paradigms about this. Um, I think that to the extent that Cuba makes progress, it will uh, open its democratic channels. That's what we would all want to see happen. But I also understand that in the circumstances that it has been living for 50 years, it was difficult for it to lose political control. And um, I'd like to remind you that this forum perhaps one day will take place in Havana, but not today. But we, no, it, it is not unimaginable, unimaginable. It, it, yeah, even today it could happen. Remember that the, the first rock concert took place there. And that is more important than this forum, let me tell you. Okay. And uh, because of the repercussions, uh, <laughs> Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your generosity with your opinions.